Hi guys, and welcome back to Stand Strong 2020. We've got an amazing interview for you here today. We've got Matt Fidais on, and Master Matt has the largest chain of uh, clubs, martial arts clubs in the world at the moment, just tipping over a thousand clubs. And we're gonna get into that in a second uh, with Matt. Welcome to Stand Strong, Matt, welcome back. Thank you, Eddie. You still didn't get my surname right, but it's okay. <laughs> so got, Fides. Fides. Yeah, Fides. you got it now. There you we go. There now. we go. Awesome. It's and, good to be here. Uh, thanks for yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Matt, I guess like we want to start um, I, with the situation at the moment has been pretty dire, and we want to sort of acknowledge that for everybody, especially um, our friends in the US who are going through some really rough times at the moment. And uh, I know you don't have any clubs in the US at the moment, but you guys are seeing some similar things in London? Yeah, so you, you mean like the protests and so on? What's going on? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Absolutely, other than COVID, it's the biggest news story here. Mm. And it's growing and growing with people protesting in London and it's getting a bit out of control. Of course, America, I've got it a lot worse. It's, sad, it's so sad really, because they've got enough to deal with let alone yeah. this as well. And um, it's shocking really to see uh, martial arts being, you know, or uh, physical force being used in that way. But um, yeah, people need to be brought to justice if they're not obeying the rules. It's simple as that really. Mm. And there's the obvious, like, uh, I guess, challenges with all the, your clubs and closed down and like, has that sort of affected you guys as far as I know in the UK, you're still in lockdown, right? And they're still really causing massive turmoil to the business. Yeah, we're approaching 40,000 deaths right now, Eddie. So the the night where the prime minister announced that all locations had to close down well, um, it was very interesting. It was at 8 p.m. on a Sunday night, I believe. And um, my phone just went off the hook. We, we were just working flat out trying to find a solution to this issue. We had rumours, I think Australia did, for about a week, where schools were declining our bookings for no real reason. So they must have got tipped off by the government what's going to happen. And same with my Australian uh, franchises too. We had some concern that something was going to happen. And on a Thursday night, they announced um, the schools are going to be closed. And we ran pretty much over a 1,000 school council facilities. So. Yeah, had we not took action, we would have been out of business overnight, Eddie. Totally. But mm. we pulled it off when we're still here. Mm. Yeah. I, I think that's a, it's a massive theme that's going on at the moment is so many dojos had so many different choices, right? Like, so there's the choice of do you just shut down, put everything on pause and try and wait it out, right? And with the unknown of that, I think, look, we've seen a lot of our customers go and do that and shut down completely. And some of them are have basically, it's been an annihilation to the business. Then there's others that have gone the whole online route and really tried to keep some of their uh, client base still rolling in. But then there's obviously huge differences to the amount of revenue and then you lose some people. So it's, it's been a real mix, a bit of an eclectic mix of the different uh, strategies, I guess, with it. And I guess it also sort of depends on like how long this lockdown has been. So in Australia, in WA here, We've sort of been the luckiest of anyone because we've had, uh, we were really the last to get locked down and we were sort of the first to get out of it, right? So we sort of got to learn off everybody else as we got locked down, but then uh, we're sort of leading the way out, right? So interestingly, for a lot of the marketing stuff, uh, I found on the way out, it's actually been really good in a way because, you know, ad costs are way cheaper. So there's less competition in the market and less people advertising, but it's just been so devastating to so many of the businesses that it's hard to really see like how some of them will survive, which is super um, interesting to see what's happening and what will happen to the ones that do survive, right? But um, yeah, tough times. And uh, and Matt, like I guess what we want to get into is um, really uh, how you've managed to build such a massive empire, how you've built, managed to build such a massive empire within martial arts and uh, and dive into a little bit of the story about how you got there. So uh, tell us sort of how you started out and uh, what style you do and uh, and your story. How did you first begin in martial arts? 
I, st I started off at seven years old. I've been bullied at school. The typical story, really, where you're getting bullied at school. And the child sat next to me in the desk. He um, was training in uh, Taekwondo. And he said to me, you know, come along and, and uh, try it. The first lesson is free. And come and check it out. And I went along to the school and trained there. And I just loved it, Eddie. There, there was nothing from that point there. I wanted to do anything else other than teach martial arts. And at the time, when you're seven years old, there's no, there's nobody else doing it full time. It was just an after school activity. Um, I guess I was lucky enough that my instructor saw the vision of me and took me under his wing and um, really pushed me hard to to strive forward and keep training hard and so on. Funny enough, he learned the martial arts business side from me now, and he he lives in Australia. He's in Victoria. Uh, um, opened up some schools there, a guy called uh, Master Tim Neath. So he was really special to me that he saw. I wasn't very good academically at all. I didn't pass any school grades. I was getting bullied a lot. I was a skinny little child, but I could naturally do the splits already for some reason. I could do all the high kicks, which I look back now and I wonder why on earth, uh, why on earth was I doing all that stuff, you know? You pay the price when you get to like 40, your hips ache and so on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he, he took me under his wing and, um, and, and pushed me, and he also had the attitude of you can do anything. So combined with weight training and martial arts, which I was like 12, 13. So I'd do my martial arts training after I'd been to the gym. And so he used to be pushing me with the weights uh, as well as training me in martial arts. So I was getting like one-on-one -on -one tuition. And I, was, I was kind of privileged in that way. And my, my parents were devastated with the idea because my mum was a lawyer, and she wanted me to – be a vet or something like that because she comes from a family of 14 children and pretty much each one of them are university graduates and then you had me come along who wanted to teach martial arts and my dad is from an industrial background working in british rail and that's like a family history my great right back to my great great granddad so they assumed i would get a trade be an electrician a plumber or something like that or or become a, a lawyer or a vet or some kind of university but not for me, Eddie, I'm afraid. I failed all my exams. And um, I remember my grandfather saying to me, you know, Matthew, you can't, you're not going to be able to make any money out throwing your legs around in the air. It's nonsense. You need to get yourself a trade. And, um, yeah, and, and I didn't really have much support there. Other than my mum, she, after the first trial, so she felt, just do what you can. And there's no such word as can't in our family. And get out there and, and make it happen. And, yeah, that's what that's what happened. Of course, you know, a few years later, they uh, they were eating their words back, and my grandfather apologized to me. Um, it was really t tough, Eddie. I mean, even like the careers advisor at my school, right in a secondary school, before you go to university, you queue up and you see your careers advisor, and you tell them, "I want to be a martial arts instructor," and she said, "Well, there's no such thing. You've got to get realistic. Go over there and look at becoming a, a fitness trainer or something like that." And I remember thinking to myself, and I think it comes from billions, like, I will show you. I will show you exactly what I can do. And li literally, I think it was like three years later, I came back to the school in a brand new Ferrari. I went to see her. I got her out of the class. She came out. She just couldn't believe it. She, she, she sat in the Ferrari out of the picture. She apologized for what she said to me. Because she could have, had I listened to her, she could have ruined my whole career. You know, yeah. and... Um, yeah, she, she was kind of proud because she really steered me on. So I'm going to show you exactly how it can be done. I didn't know how the heck I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. I was just going to find a way. I mean, that was the, the way forward for me. And do you find like, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's classical of the story of so many entrepreneurs that you don't, you're not di sort of discouraged necessarily. Like sometimes it's direct, there's direct discouragement, but sometimes it's just like people's best interest. They want... Or, or they have your best interest in mind. They think that they're helping you by trying to steer you onto like the normal career, but really it's holding you back from that sort of uh, being great at something, right? And um, when I think about your uh, story, it's some of the things you said really interesting about it being sort of underdeveloped in a way. Like, do you feel like martial arts is well developed in England now? And definitely, it would grow have grown since like the days you're talking about when you first started. And was it like super undeveloped then, so people didn't really see it as a career path in that way? It, it was everywhere, Eddie. Everywhere you can see it. But it was mm. just associations and organizations. No one had monetized it, really. You had 
a couple of organizations who had found a way to make money on merchandise and gradients and stuff like that. But nobody who really got onto the direct debit system and made it a professional business. And um, I was lucky enough, along with Ken Pankovich, to be one of the first people to be on that journey. To, to at 17 years old to come across what they're doing in America where they're like 20 years ahead of us and um, having people take me under their wing like uh, my instructor Hanshi Kovar, Dave Kovar, you recently had on um, and it's inspired me to show yeah you can you can do this and you can imagine from, from their point of view they see this like 17 year old kid who's got all this ambition and drive with no qualifications and they they want to be the ones to to really make it happen for me and uh one guy who has been very, he passed away a while ago now, um, very, very pushy to me, but in a good way, was Nick Kikinas, Nicholas Kikinas, who is the chairman and founder of EFC, Edu Educational Funding Company. And uh, he wanted to kind of make an example of me, I guess, to show that if, I can, if he can make a 17-year-old a martial arts millionaire or whatever you want to call it success, then anyone can do it. So I had, I had the, the great privilege of having Nick Kakinas take me under his wing and he must have been his late 80s, early 90s at the time. And I think I was doing good. And I say to him, you know, Mr. Kakinas, this is what I've done. He goes, you need to be more aggressive. Like, how can I be more aggressive? I, you know, I'm delivering leaflets at 5, 3 in the morning to 11 at night. I can't do any more. He didn't want to hear that, you know. And it was that mindset. My school, my school education was, I don't back it. I just felt like I was being held back, Eddie. You know, it just wasn't. It's not, you know, school's designed for one size fits all. And that wasn't for me. I, I wanted to do martial arts. And uh, I, I do believe in the law of attraction a lot. Whatever you focus on, you can materialize, you know. And if you focus on negative things, you're going to bring negative things to your life. And all I focused on is, okay, I've told everyone I'm going to be a martial arts instructor. Let's find someone who's doing it. And there must be someone in the world who's doing it. And there you go. I stumbled across Dave Kovar and a few other people. And, uh, Become great friends with them, and they're like, Matt, take whatever you can, bring it back to the UK. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Some of it worked, some of it didn't, but uh, we adapted it to the UK. And uh, we had a massive resistance against it, as you can imagine, from old school martial arts, from this then um, 18 year old who's mm. charging direct debits, charging more than them, mm. who's got the Ferraris, mm. who's got their house, who's got the incredible dojo, uh, we would call it dojo. And they can't understand it. What was he doing differently? So we had all these big names turning up at my school to see what the heck was going on. Then the martial arts magazines would be putting on me on the front cover, you know, like a Wonder Child, you know, Wonder Kid or something they used to call me. And um, they tr trying to work out what, what, what was I doing different. And um, then they started to catch on. And it took a long time. So, yeah, we, we took a lot, a lot of thorns in our success moving forward. But now they're the people who are looking to us for advice, Eddie. You know, they're like, can you forgive me? I got it wrong. Um, now they need to be commercial. They need to understand this stuff like we're doing now, digital, and be able to adapt at minutes notice and, and switch to what people really want. We're only successful, already because the families around the world want what we do. So it's not like we're selling out when our black belt exams are harder than anything else out there. We'll never just give a black belt exam out. Yeah, or you know, we, we're really tough. But just because we're commercial doesn't make make us watered down by any means. We're, we're a, a tough organization. Families appreciate what we do. That's why we're still here 24 years later, and everyone else is gone. Mm. And it's an important point, I think, that you make with uh, you know the old school martial artists looking at anything that's commercial and thinking that it is sort of watered down or it's not authentic and those types of things. And I was watching an interesting video a couple of days ago. There's a guy out there, Jesse Enkamp. He's got this um, YouTube channel, Karate Nerd. And he's talking about how there's really sort of a couple of divisions within martial arts, right? Even within, like, his karate, right? You could certainly say this of, of most of the major martial arts, Taekwondo, that there's traditional martial arts, which is essentially, like, uh, self-defense, Right, in a sense, and it is about fighting. It's got the eye gouging and the throat punches and all that type of stuff. And uh, it was really developed as an actual self-defense tool, right? Like an actual fighting, street fighting tool. But then I guess there's a sort of middle rung of um, what we would sort of think of as just martial arts now that is more about confidence building, but still has all the traditional elements, still has uh, a lot of that stuff in it. 
And then there's sports martial arts, right? So you got your Muay Thais or sports karate with much with a lot more rules in them. Uh, I think uh, I think there's a lot of confusion in the industry still with martial artists looking at some and going, well, that's not a real martial art, or this isn't a real martial art because it doesn't have, you know, it's not got the eye gouging in it, so it's not a real fighting thing because that's what you'd actually do. Or does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah, totally. I mean, when I was little, um, Eddie, you couldn't really, I, I don't believe you could have been successful in doing what I did if I didn't adapt it because, like, classes were two hours long or two and a half hours long. And the first half an hour would be front, sit in stance, front punch. Second half an hour would be sit in stance, double punch. Then I'll be high block for half an hour. Then it'll be turning kick for another half an hour. And then guess what? At the end, you get something to do something exciting, which is turning kick, turning kick. And that was just normal to us. But the retention was terrible for the members and it's not like you said teaching what it's all about which is embedded in life skills is in, um, in the martial arts is life skills positive mm. thinking goal setting, saying um having a good attitude good manners respect never giving up and those qualities were there we just didn't realize it until we brought it out of the martial arts and put it into the curriculum and made a big deal about it but yeah mm. when we trained when we were little oh, let's do some I don't see many of those organizations out around anymore. They've, they've all gone commercial to an extent where you don't see many mm -hmm. classes of two and a half hours long like we went through. Um, we just thought it was normal. But when I look back, I could see why the quit rate, there's only like 15 people in our class. You, you're not going to keep people in because it was, it was hell. I loved it because I was a bit weird, I guess. But, uh, you know, that's what I wanted to do. Like kicking, kicking ceilings at school and stuff like that, doing the splits on the chairs and, um, I mean, you just become fanatical. But if you want to be successful in the, in the business commercial side, you need to focus on education and not sport or leisure. You need to move yourself from like a, a club to a school. You need to be in the education section because education will never die. That will be around forever. There will always be a need for parents to want their children to have discipline, respect, self-control, goal-setting, self-defense. If you're talking about sports, that will come and go like fads will. Like Taibo mm -hmm. did. Do you remember Taibo? Mm -hmm. Step aerobics, other things. They all just come and go. You, know, you have to operate within the education sector. And that's why mm -hmm. we're where we are now, still growing. And we're still growing now, even online. And it's some um, really, really important thing to zone to zone in on. But initially it was tough. I mean, I was called every name under the sun. I read all these MySpace forums back then. And, but um I, had, I was lucky to have very high profile friends, and I used to complain about the they used to call me McDojo and stuff like that. And now those people now are the ones calling me for advice, by the way, uh, which I don't mind. I put my hand out and I want to help them if I understand where they're coming from. But if I see negative comments about me over, over Google or anywhere it may be, I'd ring up to my high profile friends and say, listen, that's, this is what, what's happened. And they're like, great, it's free publicity. You can't even pay for that, Matt. Give me a call back when you've got a real problem. And they put the phone bell down, you know? Mm -hmm. and that's the mindset you got to have. So, so I've been through a lot of the last 24 years. I've had so much thrown at me. I've had a very bizarre life. You can mm. say that. It's like a fairy tale. Again. We're trying to write our bi the biography at the moment, but it's so it's so complicated. It's like a fairy tale. But at the same time, um, at the same time, I think it's like there's nuggets for different different things that, that can come in there. I just lots of opportunities come your way, but I don't believe in luck. I think you make your own luck. And um, it's a lot about surrounding yourself with the most important people and making sure you, you you're careful what your mind takes in you know don't watch uh, don't read fiction books read non-fiction ones you know and look at people like you've been very clever i know it's your organization and picking out people who've had 24 30 years 35 years of success in the business and not just four or five years so they've weathered storms before they come through them all and, and that's that's what you, you need to see right now you don't want to take advice of someone who's been in business five or six years you need to see the ones um, which we call eagles. You know, eagle, eaglets grab the eagles, not the uh, the ducks of the industry who are just 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 started in the last five or six years and haven't been through the print era and uh, another recession we had in two thousand and eight, and then foot and mouth dis disease, um, uh, Ebola, and SARS, and all that type of thing. Um, so we weather the storms on all of those. So we feel that to us this is no big deal. And has presented us with more opportunity than ever. And one thing I'm really proud of the martial arts is all the politics side of it has gone. I don't know if you noticed, Eddie. It seems to have gone. Every every style 
is wanting advice right now and, and help. And people are willing to give, you know, and there's none of this politics anymore. We don't say, if you, if you go run your school by politics, you're going to go under. You need, you need to unite. And I'm starting to see that in a massive way. And I hope it will stay like that too. Yeah, well, I think like um, as martial arts gets more proliferated, people don't just do one style either, right? So like in all the schools that we see that uh, that tend to get sort of become large schools in themselves, a lot of them are doing multi-style, right? So they're sort of picking out a bit between. And we find that um, a lot of them will go, you know, have kids do martial arts and they sort of do that journey, but then they want to move on to something else in that teen sort of age, right? And rather than them leave, we sort of move them style to style. Do you find that uh, with your clubs that you can go multi-style or have you guys stuck basically to Taekwondo and how does that work? Um, they get their qualifications of the basic Taekwondo syllabus. Um, how, however, they don't, um, we, over the years, of course, if you want to start my son, Hero, come and say hello. Say so hello, Hero. Hi. Right, say hi, Australia. Hi, Australia. Okay, go see mommy. Go see mommy. Um, so yeah, over the years, we've had to ad adapt so if you just stick to one style, so Taekwondo is very much kicking um, patterns uh, and so on. We didn't feel there was enough there to to keep people retained and for you to offer. You, so if you look at our curriculum, we've got a combination of Taekwondo, um, grappling, jiu-jitsu, kung fu, and we have a, have a leadership upgrade program, which has access to weapons and so on training too. So we adapt it. So the curriculum is main base Taekwondo. But inside their lessons, they're going to get taught a whole range of different styles to make the classes fun and exciting so you can retain your members because you can't you can't just survive just by te teaching a traditional martial art. People don't want to just learn a kata anymore. You mm. want to get in the parents' head. You have to have, um, we call it, people have uh, black belt eyes mm. if, you, if you brought up... Um, from 97, 90. So if you look at the world of black belt eyes, you're going to be in trouble. You've got to look at in parents' eyes. What do they want? They're not mm. interested in how many championships you've won or how many all these awards and stuff you've won. They can care less. All they want to know is what are you going to do for my child to make him more disciplined, more respectful, so he can grow up to be a success like you. That's all they want to be. And that's the key. So the lessons are very high energy. We're very strict on the curriculum. So the qualification they, they do get is in Taekwondo, freestyle Taekwondo. Um, however, it's the lessons are, are fun, exciting, with a, a huge range of different arts being brought in. And we're also always mixing it up and, and making it happen too. We have Kenpo, Karate now, and all, all types of different things. So we have a formula that works now. So we just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Mm, mm. And um, I guess, the, you know, with UFC, it, it, I guess there's been a change in the way that people look at martial arts over time, right? So as far as adults, uh, if they're doing it for actual self-defense or actual sports fighting or those types of things, aside from the sort of fitness and confidence stuff, they'd want to do a combo of styles, right? So like you guys definitely catered to that. But um, it, it is right. I think like I think you've got a, a really profound message there with the actual kids and looking at parents, right? And the marketing is we're really uh, essentially the product is what they get out of it, right? So it's the long-term life achievements. So when I'm looking at writing copy a lot for ads, and this is an important lesson for anybody writing ads out there, is that we want to think about long-term, like so the long-term of what does it actually do for your children? Like what does it mean if they get confidence? Because it's not confidence in itself or it's not discipline, but it's what that means for them. And you alluded to that, right? Saying like, uh, that life of success. They want to see you guys as role models and get that life of success that you've got. And so there is that confidence and discipline, and I think we can concentrate on those, but also, I guess, selling that journey, right, and going on that long-term journey. So I think it's really profound that you pop that in there. Um, let's jump on to career. Like, how did you get from, I guess, your martial arts uh, passion and then sort of turn it into a career? Because I know you did security at some point, uh, between or at the same time? How did that pan out? Like, how did you go or begin your career? That came later. So, um, so I have five schools and I've been to America many times, brought all this information, but implemented it. And um, we were running at about 3,000 members, something like that. Um, 
and uh, I didn't really can see a way forward because the next town for me was at 45 miles and I couldn't see how I could get an instructor to travel from where we were up to there, there to teach. So I like stuck in my own little bubble, really. I felt like I, felt like I was retired, Eddie, you know, I was 21. And yeah, I just felt like I was retired. My schools were rammed. We had at a full-time center, we had two floors going on back to back and we had a microphone and I'll talk to them from the office like that child over there needs a bit more attention, go and grab him and mm. try and coordinate it. And then, of course, we had our schools in the other four towns as well. So it, it was at 21, I, I thought that was it, really. I thought that was, that was, um, yeah, that was my, I, I had the Ferrari, I had the house paid off. I didn't have to work anymore. Mm, then, how, did then this, you, um, how did you open that first school? Like, uh, so you, you'd done, uh, you'd got up to your high level of training and then, did you take the plunge and just open a school or did you start in the school hall and how did that sort of transition? Well, I, I not only know this, but I actually failed at first, totally failed. And I, um, I opened up um, in a little village called Braunton and I advertised and no one's shown up. I used to put posters up and no one would show up. And then um, what would happen then is, uh, I, yeah, I almost gave up. And then one day I did this big launch in the town and it was on a Sunday morning and nobody turned up at all. And at that stage, I just thought, oh, well, my mum's right. My dad's right. My grandparents are right. I'm going to have to try and go back to being, I was, I was working as a lifeguard for £2.75 an hour. And I was making sure people were safe, but at the same time trying to think, how the hell can I do this? How can I make this happen? Because I want to prove everybody right here. Mm. And when I got home, I realised after that launch day, I turned on the news and realized Princess Diana died. And that's why no one turned up to my first class. It was on a Sunday morning, sometime in uh, August. The that was 1997? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So then I thought, I'm going to give it another go. And I gave it another go, and I got to about 20 members. And I used to, uh, I used to collect the, it's three pounds a session. I used to collect it in these ice cream tubs at the end. And then come back to the bank. And even the bank were impressive. I was making like, I don't know, 150 pounds a night, but my hall rent was 20 pounds a month. Uh, even the bank were shaking their heads thinking, you know, what are they doing? I was, so I teach three, like three or four nights a week and earn more than everyone else was teaching full time. Mm. And then, of course, I stopped across what America was doing. Got myself out there and then came back and made it more professional. We used music in the lessons. Um, we, we modified our curriculum. We um, made it more educational, put people on direct debits, which was a key thing, for the right price as well, having your own value. And then I grew in, um, from 20 to over 100 members in this little village, and there's only 10,000 people that live there. Um, and then the next step was my full-time school, which was about six miles from there. And I was trying to convince the um, landlord that I wanted to rent this building. It's a huge build building which back then was up for about £9,000 a year. And that's a lot of money for a, a little skinny guy comes in and tells this guy, I want to rent your building. What do you do? And I teach martial arts. He said, well, you can't make, you're not going to pay my rent teaching karate. But my mum was a property lawyer, so she had a bit of influence. She's like, you know, give, give my son a chance. I think he could pull this through. So they gave me six months free rent, as long as I decorate the place and so on. So we worked over Christmas Day and Boxing Day and New Year's Day decorating the full-time academy in hope that in January of 97, 98, sorry, in hope of January 98, I'll be able to have some members come in and get past that six months rent free period and make it happen. And um, yeah, well, within six months, we had 650 like members, paying members at an average of 59 to 69 pounds a month. And um, it, the place was rocking. My landlord couldn't believe it. We went on to take another floor then in the building. Mm. So, uh, it so became this. If you had that failed launch, right? And uh, and then, like, you had sort of uh, something change from then, because that was on the day with Diana, right? But then, like, how did you promote? Because this was way before the internet. So, you, you would have had to do more sort of organic or more offline promotion. Was it sort of flyers or newspaper? How did you guys get yourself out there? Yeah, we used to, I used to uh, deliver leaflets from 5 30 in the morning. 11 o'clock at night through people's doors put posters up 
And then the old school people would take them down as fast as I'm putting them up. I, I used to lose sleep over that, Eddie. I laugh at it now. And and um, be just be as aggressive as you can. There was no. We had um, MySpace and emails around, but not really used. And and my education. And now you, you can go on things like this and learn. I had to get on a plane to go to America to be with Dave Kovar or um, Nick Kikinis and his sons and so on to another school owner's the network. The old-fashioned way. I think we went back and forth to America about eleven times in eighteen months. It was pretty intense, but it was the people I surrounded myself with. They were all successful school owners who have made it big time, and I was at that education at such a young age. So I wasn't making any mistakes. I was going straight in at the high road. So what changed for my adverts? I was changing it from uh, Matt Fidesz, who had these amazing kicking abilities, and um, splits on chairs to impress people and trying to win competitions all the time to scare all that let's talk life skills mm. this is what we're going to do for your child we're going to parents wish list you know discipline respect self-control and good manners put those and i put one little advert out in the local paper got completely inundated and the enrollment day i spent 20 minutes or about half an hour actually with every new person who's inquiring and i would give them one-on-one -on -one intro lesson and it was just me back then there was no team it was just me so mm -hmm. literally from eight in the morning to nine at night i was booked up every half an hour and at the end of each one i'd sign them up onto a direct debit mm -hmm. and back then it was controversial we used to have contracts back then collection companies weren't doing easy go easy easy come up direct debit so it was 12 month fixed terms which mm -hmm. kind of bit us a little bit it, it, people weren't used to that in america it's very normal they call it accounts receivable Quite normal over there to sign people up to three years at a time so we modified that quite quickly but now we had them queuing up around the block and I, I used to go into like um to get something to eat you know in a shop and be in the queue and hear people talking about me and this this amazing center that's open i was thinking wow we've got something big here and then i thought can i do it again can i do it again the next time was biddeford about seven eight miles away mm. did it all over again you know 150 members in a weekend Mm. And um, then we did it again. Again, we got five locations. There was nowhere else to go. Very secluded area, and I was quite happy with that, I guess, in a strange way. But, uh, happy, uh, that. And that's when the security side came in, and uh, the, the the crazy publicity, which led me to be pulled into another direction, which led me to the franchise. So. Mm, mm. And in that process, I guess you, you would have had to build the staffing, right? And your team and the different locations that have to train people up for each location. Like, was that all internal? Did you build your leadership team from uh, people you trained within the dojo? Yeah. Mm. Uh, all within, we're all within. We, we had to figure it out because we didn't really, well, I didn't really know what I was doing in terms of, in England, training team members. Like, it's never been done before. So all I had to go by is what was going on in America. And like I said, they were like 20, 30 years ahead of us in, in um, martial arts business and um, the way you teach as well. And the standards out there were just insane. I was expecting to go to America when I first heard about it. See, very low standards, but they were better than us, the way they worked things out. And we all know now, intensity workouts in short periods are better than two or three hours. You know, half an hour, you get more done. You produce more growth hormone, adrenaline. And you'll burn more fat and, and get more cardio and, and muscle tonus and so on than going to the gym for two or three hours so those guys had already figured all this stuff out so yeah internal instructor recruitment and then i would cut them into the income of that particular location so when i grew they grew and they got mm -hmm. to the stage where they were earning ridiculous amounts of money for teaching mm -hmm. two nights a week in a local in a local primary school and i didn't mind i didn't mind at all because it made them work harder. They were like my partners, not just employees. Mm. And that's that's how we build our success even to this day. They're all results driven, every single one of them. Yeah, I like that. And I, I think, um, you know, so many people struggle with uh, training someone up and putting all that time and effort in and then they leave, right? But it sounds like you guys had just such a strong team. Yeah. You sort of had that retention. And then how did that move? How did you then get into uh, your sort of security uh, and the more famous stuff you're doing, the Michael Jackson career part? Well, that was never part of the plan, Eddie. That was just one of those 
um, situations that came about due to I had a journalist come into the school in the main school, the one that I was talking about, and I had seen I had 750 active members per week training, and it was making a big noise in the town, very small town, 20,000 people. And um, a freelance journalist came in saying, Listen, do you mind if I interview you about your story? So he went back to me being bullied, the careers of advisor, and so on. And they did some photos of me. And I said to him, Is going to make the local paper? He goes, Yeah, yeah, absolutely, without a doubt. Um, wow. Two days later, I was on the front page of every national paper in England. And they had bullied all become a millionaire. And then from there, I went on to a TV show, like talk shows. Um, uh, where, they, where they interview you, where you do bully and they were trying to smoke out who's the bully at the time, to try and bring him back. And uh, that's another story, he actually works with us now. We, 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 we um, reunited years ago on live TV, morning TV. Uh, that was their goal, but they loved the story so much that they just massive news. It became attention uh, to um, one of my uh, closest friends now, which is Yuri Geller. I think in, in Australia in the 70s and 80s, we were more famous for Bender and Spoons, I think, with Brooklyn and Bender and Weinhauer and so on. And he contacted me and he, he did a lot of positive things like Tony Robbins type stuff. You can do anything you want. You, can, you are who you surround yourself with with these seminars all around the world, TV shows all around the world. He's much more to him than Spoon Bender. And um, he wanted to do a video with me where I did like an anti bullying type message to the kids. And he did the mind power to stop bullying for the kids to not let it get to them. A lot of it's mentally there. And you try and avoid the, the contact. And we became best friends. And then um, what happened next is uh, just by chance is that Michael Jackson was doing a concert in Wembley Arena. And he knew, my, Yuri Geller knew how I was going to. I had no idea that his best friend was Michael Jackson at all. So I went and stood with my girlfriend at the time amongst 80,000 people and stood there being squashed Eddie, you know, like all the fans going mad and were being squashed and and um, watching this guy dance like crazy on stage, you know, totally in awe because he's a billionaire, he just had it all down, perfection. And I come away, I drive home and Yuri Geller calls me, he said, what did you think? I said, yeah, I think he's the guy's amazing, what he's done and how he's come from a poor boy in Indiana of all those children in a two-bed house that, and the, the richest pop star of all time, the most successful. And I think he sold out six nights, 80,000 people back then. I didn't know Yuri was his best friend. I had no idea. And I think at the time, Michael was staying at his house uh, in um, Sonnen on Thames, Reading. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure if I remember rightly. Then what happened then, about three or four days later, Yuri Geller calls me at three in the morning, which wasn't unusual because successful entrepreneurs don't just turn off at 10 o'clock at night. They, they'll keep going. So it's quite, get, Yuri was, uh, he's got businesses all around the world, success all around, he's world famous. So he would ring me at 3.30 in the morning, I'd take the call and he wanted me to travel from Devon to his house, which was probably a good 200 mile drive. And he couldn't tell me why. So I had to try and explain that to my other half, which, which was interesting, very difficult. Cause uh, you know, it looks like where on earth you going this time of night, you know? Mm -hmm. So he said to me, if you don't come down, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. And I, Just dropped out there for a second, uh, guys. So bear with us for a moment. And uh, we're just going to come back to you guys in about five minutes or a couple of minutes when we can get the stream up and running again. And uh, Jen, do you want to just chuck on the... Oh, no. Yeah, go to branch. Okay, bear with us one second, guys. We're going to be back with you in a moment.
Hey. All right, sorry about that. A little technical issue there. Matt, can you hear me there? Okay, it proves that we're live, Eddie, doesn't it? Oh, we're back on. Excellent. <laughs> that is the story of people's uh, last couple of months, I think, trying to run Zoom classes. Yeah, it's been yeah. that exact thing, right? So, um, we'll where we to... were at, I think we were talking, like, we've gotten into Michael Jackson, but I think we just missed at the start of that. We got, we cracked up a bit. Um, how you met Yuri and uh, and then how he introduced you because I we picked up where you were uh, at a Michael Jackson concert and uh, you were, he was best friends with Michael right uh, but how were you friends what was your connection with Yuri so Yuri contacted me on the back of the matter we had um, after that journalist came into my school because I was all over the television we had TV shows called Trish Joe and Kilroy and morning mm. TV shows and all the tabloids front page of it buddy boy becomes a millionaire and he saw that and he wanted to make a video with me to distribute to schools he would mm. do positive mind power um how to you know stay strong and stay away from trouble and i would do basic self-defense and give it away to schools for free in england mm. so we became best best friends and um mm. yeah then i went to the concert and he, you know, he, Yuri's got a very secretive life. I knew he had very famous clients, and and I never knew anything about Michael Jackson being a client. So on that drive back, he obviously knew I I, I enjoyed the show, and I think it was just about four or five days later where he called me to come to his house, and um, I walked into the living room, and I see this little skinny guy walk up to me, and he did a bow and said. Uh, Nice to meet you, Master Podesta. I'm Michael Jackson. I think, well, I know who you are. What the heck are you doing here? You know, I was at your concert just a few days ago. And we just, we just became real good close friends at first. That was before the security side kicked in. Mm. And then um, Michael essentially introduced you uh, to a different way of thinking, right? Like, uh, we had a quick chat about it and uh, opening your mind up to like a higher level of possibilities and networking? Yeah, yeah, because you know, Mike, Michael I know has this controversial image and I, I'm not, as a friend of his, I'm not gonna, um, I, you know, I understand the public may be a bit confused what the guy was like, but you remember, you don't get to be the biggest successful superstar man of all time um, in business and, and in music without being clever. And he was very clever, especially when it comes to marketing and PR. So most of the stuff you've seen has been due to marketing and PR. And um, from that first night onwards, we had this deal that he would teach me the moonwalk if I were teaching the break boards. Now, I taught him how to break boards because he had his huge hands and, he, you know, he, he was quite a strong figure. But the moonwalk thing never really took off for me at all. But, but he also wanted to meet Shannon Lee. So what Michael would do, he would zoom in on successful people and he would study them because he couldn't really go out anywhere. Mm. So he had this obsession. He had this obsession with Bruce Lee. He knew every, if I was watching a Bruce Lee film with him, Eddie, wherever we go, he would enter the dragon. Like, he would know every word, you know, uh, all the way through to the end. It irritate me. I used to say to him, "Come on, man, I'm trying to watch the film." <laughs> you know, he would know everything. And uh, balls don't hit back. And he used to say out loud, and then he would say that should be shot at that angle. Bruce didn't get it right. And if you try and watch a movie of him, he couldn't make it happen. <laughs> so I, I said to him, I, I, you know, he wanted to meet Shannon Lee. And we had a friend in common who knew Diana Inosanto very well, who was Shannon Lee's best friend, and Bruce mm -hmm. Lee's um, goddaughter. So we managed to um, connect to to them. Um, and yeah, I, Shannon, Shannon wasn't too keen. I mean, all Michael wanted to do was meet Shannon and his mum so he could absorb as much as Bruce Bruce's thought process and take back into his own mindset. And you'll see he has like martial arts and his dancing, you see the kick in there and the, and the reflexes and so on. He got he got stuff on the martial arts. So he was already a black belt when I met him, a black belt in um, a black sash in kind of food. They all got trained, all the Jackson five got trained in martial arts when they were younger. They got made to by their dad. Mm. And he got to the stage where so famous he couldn't carry on so he had a couple of object things that he wanted to do he wanted to meet bruce lee's uh ex-wife and um daughter because brandon had already passed away and he wanted to he wanted to um restart his training again too and so that's why i came on board now i never had any ambitions of being a bodyguard or any of that type of stuff 
that came that just came naturally because I saw my friend get get into a situation where I, I couldn't pull away. I had to be there and help him through it. And I had this organization that I could mm. supply trained martial artists um, to help protect him for free. Mm. He was getting people were charging him crazy amounts of money to be protected. He didn't trust them. They were selling stories to the newspapers. And so I think Yuri was looking for somebody like me to put in his life. I was already successful by then. I was already financially independent. And um, yeah, I just, he just felt I'd be a perfect friend for Michael. He never had many friends, you know, and uh, mm. then it, drew, it came on from there. And after he left Yuri's house, he's, I said to him, I, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd take a shot at it because I wanted to visit Neverland. You know, I said to him, I'm talking about Neverland and, and, and everything. And I said, uh, Give me a number and I'll give you a call sometime. And then he said to me, I haven't got really got a number, Matt, because if the people, if I have a number, I get calls all around the world from fans, the media get it, I get quoted, so I don't have a telephone number. All he has is like a PA. And I thought he was just trying to get rid of me, you know. So he gave me this number to ring. And he said he'll call me within two weeks. And I didn't believe him. Three weeks went past. And then um, I remember a staff at my academy, my full time school. They played back the answer phone messages one morning. There's like a minute and a half long message from Michael Jackson. And they're calling me up at home saying, uh, nah, you wouldn't believe it. Michael Pippin Jackson's just called, left a message on the answer phone and he wants you in New York right away, you know, to come out there. And uh, he flew me out to New York and I was out there for a couple of, couple of weeks with him. He was recording an album called Invincible at the time. And then, um, yeah, we just became good friends. And then the security stuff just happened naturally. As um, we realized that financially he wasn't as strong as he thought he was, and people were taking advantage of his fame in the situation. So I worked for him completely, totally for free. But you're right in saying that I had access to a mindset that you couldn't you, you couldn't buy. I was having dinners with the owner of Harrods, a billionaire, a, a multi billionaire, the owner of Harrods, the famous, I'm sure you've heard of it, in um, London. Um, mm. And then Yuri Geller. Michael Jackson on the table and Daryl Hannah from Kill Bill and, and that series. And I'm pinching myself thinking, how the heck did I get here? I'm just a guy with no qualifications, you know? And I used to have to lie to my friends and family. What do you do at the weekend? Well, I couldn't say I've been hanging out with David Blaine and Daryl Hannah and Mama Hannah fired and Michael Jackson. I think I'm loopy. So it wasn't until actually we got seen out in public that people actually started to realize, geez, man, this is real. This Matt, is best friends of the biggest star in the world but the mindset what well, you know you've all heard the saying where great minds talk about ideas and medium minds talk about things and small ideas um small, small um medium minds talk about ideas and uh, small minds talk about people well all i got saw floating around the room is that ideas and how can we how can we take this to the next stage how can we you know get things better and michael was his own the only com competitor for Michael Jackson was Michael Jackson. There was no one else. And that mm -hmm. was the thing he found it hard to battle with. So I was, I was told, you know, learning from all these people. So whereas my friends or my age group were going out night clubbing, getting drunk and so on, I was hanging out with these guys. And uh, I think that has a major impact on you, you know. And when I look back now, I appreciate it. Back then, I just thought it was normal. Mm -hmm. And I had, to, I, had, I had to keep things secret because of their fame. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, his story is so, uh, you know, you, you, you sort of compare him to Bruce Lee, right? And you can really see that driven vision, that superstar, that different level of drive that's in, in him. And I often wonder if sort of really successful people, entrepreneurs, people like yourself, people like Michael, do, are they driven by something that's happened to make them feel like not enough to have to always be build and prove, you know? Like it's almost like even for myself and some of my friends who are entrepreneurs, they've got this little chip right on, on their shoulder almost that sort of drives them on to be better and better and better. But then at some point it sort of transcends past just, you know, doing it for someone else, right? It's not even for someone else at some point, but there's no real time when you can look at it and go well that was the point that it turned into it being self-driven rather than a chip on the shoulder sort of thing do you sort of feel like that was true of michael yeah. or yourself well i found that most of my successful friends or like in the billionaire range have all had terrible childhoods eddie i mean that that's the mm. common theme mm. and it's, it's well known that 
that Mike had a, a very tough childhood. And, you know, he was a sensitive person. So you could argue that his brothers may be like, uh, like Marlon's only um, a year older. Randy's Jackson is two years younger. Why didn't they turn out with, with um, problems? But Michael was very sensitive and he was, he believed he was put on this planet to do what he does, but he, he could not really handle the negativity that was thrown out of him. He used to say he had to grow one off his skin. And he said that to me too, in the martial arts industry. You know, if I wanted to carry on that all this negativity that I was experiencing from other martial artists is actually free publicity. And he used to say all the time, Matt, you've got to worry about it when people aren't talking about you. And, um, and that, that was really stuck in my mind. You've got to keep people talking about you. He used to make a great effort to keep himself controversial. Um, and he used to say, you've got to be interesting for people to be interested in you. And so I took away a lot of that information. And I kept myself in a closed bubble for many years until like recent times, really. But mm. people would look in thinking, how the heck's he done this? So it's more the mindset education than anything else. You know, they, they wouldn't spend, they would invest. And um, I remember Mohammed or Fayed telling me, um, it was a Saturday night and we were having dinner at his house. Michael was there uh, and um, a few other movie stars and stuff. And I don't know why the heck I was there, but I was there as the friends. And Mohammed said to me, it's Saturday night and this is a very important night. And I say, why, why is that Mohammed? Why is it so important? He said, well, it's 11 o'clock, Matt. And right now we're talking about ideas on how we can increase our income and expand what we do. Whereas people right now are spending that money in nightclubs right now. And we make up the 3% of the, of the people, and the everyone else is out there just living week to week when they don't realize if they pulled back, they need to, they need to spend more time on um, their life. You know, they spend so much time on planning their holidays, vacations, than they do their life. And we, I sat down with the guys and they created like this life plan for me. They wanted to see what, they held me accountable. And it, it was, at times it was tough. I mean, you imagine having the biggest star in the world call you. And um, I had my Argos, my Argos, if you have Argos over there, like a cheap, like um, cordless phone, which would cut out every now and then. And I had, had the biggest star on the phone from America, you know, in America, and he, he had this gold-plated, incredible phone at Neverland. And I said, how are you done? I've done great. I've, I've done 30 new members in this school, Mike. And he goes, oh, well done, Matt. I said, how are you done, Mike? Good, I just closed a deal on an $80 million contract. I used to come off and feel terrible, you know? I just felt, God, i got a long way to go. But, um, yeah, you become... I you know, level up. Yeah. It made you step up. It mm. held me accountable. They all did. Mm. I had to feel. Like I wanted. I wanted the houses like they had and the cars they had. And it's not so much the lifestyle because he, he in particular, didn't have the lifestyle. Because even at Neverland, he'd have to walk around with bodyguards because people would parachute in and say they don't buy a mistake just so they get to try and meet him. So he didn't really have any privacy. But the um, it's to be able to do what you want whenever you want. And you can arrive at your problems with style. And help people out who who need it. And that's that's the important part with being financially independent and something to leave to your children. Um, money doesn't make you happy, but it certainly makes you arrive at your problems with style and can make other people happy too. That's what I've noticed. So um, yeah, I've been poor and broke, but I, I, I you know real broke when I was starting off this thing. I had a hundred pounds in the bank account. That's why I started off my for this martial arts with hundred pounds. Mm. And um, I was excited when I made my, I had a thousand pounds on my balance, and then it. They just went absolutely crazy, mm. uh, but I was obsessed, absolutely obsessed with with, with doing. It. I just loved the martial arts so much, I had the passion, and to me, it wasn't work. It was my dream coming true. And so all the showbiz side of it, that was never planned. Of course, it wasn't. That was that was uh, whatever you want to make of that. I don't. I got no idea. That's, it was a, a kind of like a fairy tale thing, I guess. But whatever you focus on is what you get. And I was focused on all these successful people. I never asked Yuri Geller for anything at all. And that introduction, it changed my life. And Michael made me aware too, when he left to go back to the States, he said, uh, are you going to be my friend? I said, well, of course I am. It was like a child asking for exceptional friendship. Why'd you ask that? He said, well, if you're going to be my friend, your life will never be the same again. You'll always be referred to as Michael Jackson's bodyguard or, or you, things I do may rub off on you. And, and so on, and he was so right. You know, the day he died, it just turned from Matt Finesse, the martial arts success guy, to uh, 
Michael Jackson's bodyguard. And that's the way he's ever been. But I've learned to live, I've learned to live with it now. But it's yeah, it's a huge part of my success. And would I have been successful without all that? I don't know. I you know, I don't think I would have gone out of those five schools, Eddie. I really don't. I think mm. um the way you put it to me, I, I was in this hotel suite and like I said, I've got these five schools and I can't take any further of Michael. And I was getting quite upset with him because he was so pushy. Mm. He said, Listen, I, I, I'm a poor boy from Gary, Indiana. And I've got the biggest record of all, all time, Thriller. No one's beaten it. And um, I set up stadiums. If I can do that all around the world, you can get someone to travel 40 miles and open school and put them all around the world. I said, well, how do I do that? And he got a napkin out. And I wish I kept it. And he said, it's called franchising. And he mapped it out. It's how you do it. You take a percentage. You take your model uh, system that you have and you franchise it out. And he introduced me to a franchise lawyer because he was franchising his brand out all the time back then. He had his own, like, Range so that, was Michael, that was actually Michael was going through the franchise model with you the first time. Yeah. And, and, I, and I said to him, I said, mm. I said to him, it can't be done. It's never been done before martial arts. Mm. And he said, that's exactly why you've got to do it, man. That's what he said. Yeah. It's like he was the first black man on TV. That's what he said to me. It, it's super interesting, like what you say there about a, a couple of things, like that success a few things on success, but also like that nobody had done this before, right? So nobody had really franchised in a, in a mass way uh, martial arts. And and you've talked a lot about modeling people, right? So that having successful people around you and modeling what they do and going to the US when you did early on sort of taught you those tricks and fast track your journey, right? But then I guess there's always that thing with entrepreneurs of looking at if something hasn't been done before, does that mean that it's just not a success, right? And that it's not a successful way of doing it. Or does it mean that just nobody's thought of doing it before or hasn't done it successfully, right? So I think, um, you know, often with entrepreneurs trying to start out and do something totally new and totally revolutionary, it can be like a really hard mental battle because, you know, as you know, like building it from that start out makes it so challenging, right? And I guess, um, we're sort of going through this a little bit at the moment with Tima because we look at ourselves like, yes, we're a coaching company, right? And we do train people in business, in martial arts, but really we're interested in something a bit bigger and a bit more, right? As far as we really want to create more of a movement to organize the industry, right? So if you look at it at the moment, there is a bit of a mixture of the old school martial arts and the old school federations and a lot of the federations aren't particularly well run and and there's breakaway uh different styles all over the place and um and obviously the conflicts that go with that we covered some of those and sort of i guess like our mission in a way is to sort of help organize that whole industry right and bring it together more than having clashes between the different styles and types of martial arts and stuff and i sort of look at that as it is something totally different and new right so we got to sort of figure out the model and uh, it's definitely crossed my mind like should we be going and doing something totally new or should we just be looking at a tried and tested type model right and um like when you started doing this as franchise did you have those doubts where you were like well if nobody's done this before is it because it doesn't isn't a way that it can be done right like the criticism that would have felt fell on your shoulders and what sort of pushed you Absolutely. past Absolutely. And I, I looked for examples around the world and no one had done martial arts franchising in not even America. Mm. But, when, but when you got Michael who rings your mum up and says, I've told Matt what he's going to do, make sure he does it. And, mm. uh, you know, and, and holds you accountable. You're in a bit of trouble. I'm telling you, cause mm. he used to say to me, uh, that, you know, he can, he can make press with a flick of a button and he wanted, he wanted to see me, see me make it there. And not just him too, like um, Nick Aquinas, who was with the EFC at the time, he, he used to, on the business side, used to be a big mentor as well, like always invest in property. And um, he tried to stop me doing all the things we all do when you're successful buying the Ferraris and Bentleys and stuff. But you've got to get out of your system, I think. It's not something you can teach. And uh, you look back and regret it. But it's, um, he really pushed me on the property side, which kind of secured my future by the time I was 26. My mm -hmm. buy to let portfolio. Uh, but again, Mike... Um, yeah, how be accountable? And then Yuri Geller got to know about it. He was my best mate, still is to this day, 73 years old. And uh, my whole inner circle knew about how I, 
Michael was telling everybody, all his brothers, and I was like, wow, I've got no choice. I've got to make this happen, and haven't I? He even went as far as introducing me to a franchise lawyer. And they basically said, what you've got is a franchise. You've done it. You've got the mm. model. You've just got to tie it up, legalize it, and um, lend your name to it and get out and PR it. And as from mm. Michael, I got to learn how to use the media well, PR side mm. and um, marketing, how, how you can market. There's always a way to get business, you know. And, and um, yeah, I was, so I could get these people on the phone, which were mm. just incredible when I look back. When you're 18, 19, 20 years old, Eddie, you, you don't appreciate it. It, it was mm. just uh, a normal situation to me then. They were just my friends who just happened to be famous. Mm. And I'll keep their life confidential and didn't talk about them much. And I had a very strange kind of growing up adulthood, I guess, because I didn't go to nightclubs until I was like 27 or so. And, and um, to have alcoholic drinks until I was 27, I was just talking was about business the whole time so mm. once i had the model i knew i could just keep repeating it and we sold the first franchise when i got the first franchise sale it's before they all knew i, I was linked to these guys too because they didn't become public to i i walked on um stage with with, with michael at a award show and and then people started to cost them on a little bit so people the first franchise i sold was was uh twenty five thousand pounds in the north of england and once they got the first one down, you got your first testimonial, and that was it. And we did like 450 in a year, Eddie. It was unbelievable. I, I was getting called from my um, my team, We're driving down with these huge texts, and they were just selling it. And, was, and we were delivering the, the training to them and making sure the quality was there and going as far as doing the gradings for them all over the country as well, which I know my team have been doing in Australia for years, you know, mm -hmm. flying over from one place to the next and because and so, they're so spread out. Um, but it just it just went absolutely crazy, and then we made the front page all the fitness press, the martial arts press, and um, that was that. And we're still here now. So so let's like unpack I guess a little bit about franchising, right? So it's for anyone who's at that five school mark or three school mark, I know a lot of um, dojos in this um, circumstance, right? And a lot of them they have I guess. The ba their barrier, like you said earlier for you, was you, you get to that and you can't push past it, right? What do you feel like is the difference between uh, getting to that sort of two or three club mark to then it just being replicatable? Like what is different as far as structures that you've got in place? Like do you have a list of there's this 10 things you just need in a franchise if you're going to replicate it quickly and without uh, like massive headache on everyone that you take on. Yeah, so, so over the last 24 years, it's like a business in a box, which they buy off you. Mm. And you only become successful if you make them success already. So the only reason I'm here now is because I've made an awful lot of people very, very, very successful. So the first few years is where you put, as a franchisor, is where you put the hard work in. You're basically working for free. And then you get the come, you get the payback later on in the in the life. So you're like a consultant to them, really. And with my team, we call it the MF family. I, I pretty much have a good idea of what everyone's doing all you know, around, even in Australia. Yeah, you know, then the names of the children, and we, we really go the extra mile to 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 make sure we, we shake every hand and, and meet everybody. And even when I came to Australia, my last visit a few years ago, man, those guys worked me. We we went from. Um, I remember Ryan Canavan saying that we've got to go visit uh, a place called Gladstone. And um, we turn up at an airport. I didn't realize we we're going to catch a plane, but it's quite normal to you guys over there. So we catch a plane to, to Gladstone. And then um, we, we do an appearance there. And I'm like mounting because I'm not used to this humidity. It's unbelievable. And then <laughs> I did like 500 pictures and autographs. I spent time with every student, like the first time you've ever met them. It was really important. Then flew, we flew back. And it's literally tag team with Chris Weir, who uh, runs the curriculum, head of curriculum over there, onto another aeroplane to a place called um, Townsville, I think I remember rightly. And I was exhausted. I, I mean, this is normal to these guys flying around doing gradients, whereas in England, we moan if we had to drive 10 miles to take a test or something. <laughs> it was normal. So by, by the end of the schedule, I, the first, when I arrived in Australia, I wanted to visit the zoo with Steve Irwin and my wife and so on, but they, they got word I was out there my fault on Instagram, I went to Master Canavan's first um, 
uh, one of his classes that evening, just as a favour to him, in uh, I think it's Koala Bay on the Sunshine Sunshine Coast. And um, yeah, after that, I was getting a message: "Please, you come to my school tomorrow." And I was doing like every day, right until the day we left. And I was glad to go on that plane. I was absolutely exhausted. I <laughs> slept all the way back to England. But it's, it's all it's all about your mindset, staying positive. And there was nobody doing what I was doing, and no one doing what was, what Ryan took back to Australia. And so Ryan Canavan, who runs with Sam Weir, Chris Weir, Matt for this martial arts Australia, he had the ambition to see what I had done, done in England and to keep coming back to Australia. And, uh, you know, the first time I, I met him, I thought, great, you got the ambition, but is he going to come back again? Sure enough, he saves enough money, he come back again. And he come back again. And in the end, I started paying for a few flights to him. He comes every summer, I take all the notes to him implemented into Australia. He was really leading the way in Australia uh, and still is in, in terms of martial arts business. Um, so he, he must have visited me you know, 15, 16 times over a three year period to get the education because we didn't have this then. He had to get on the aeroplane. He, you know, if I said to him next week, well, maybe not in today's time, but in normal times, I want you to come to an event, he'll be on the plane. He comes here for three days just to support his team who are taking Dan grades. Um, just to fly here. That's how serious we take it in the organization. But you, you do have to think out of the box. And um, with, with franchise, it's, very, it's a very interesting situation because you can try and figure all this stuff out yourself and, and take 10, 15 years, and you might work it out. I doubt it. And I've always said, I'm always very honest, if I, if I was to map for this today, 18 years old, looking to develop what I've got now, I don't believe I would have been able to do it, Eddie. I think... There comes a little bit with being in the right place at the right time with the right people, the longevity, because if you've been in the round for 24 years, people are going to listen to you. You know, you've seen it all. There's not any problem we've not come across that we haven't overcome in the industry. So, so if I were to start off my own now, it would be tough. Back then, it was just me and a few other guys, Ken Pankovic, and, and um, there, was, there was nobody else really doing anything. And, and, even now, this they don't really making a, a big noise in the industry. We almost got the industry to ourselves. But to try and create what we did again, I don't believe it'll ever be done again. So I think with us, our successes, you can try and figure out yourself, or you can get to three or four hundred members and be financially independent with twelve to eighteen months if you just jump on board. Now, what motivates people is very interesting. It's either financial or ego, and in martial arts, we all we all have. Have the situation where sometimes ego comes into play. You know, we don't want to get rid of our style name. You know, we could we could be whatever, something, something kung fu, which means nothing to the general public. But to you, it means something because the way you've been raised in the martial arts. But you almost got to um, leave that your ego at the door if you want to be successful in the industry. So franchising is a way of just cutting the corners and pretty much guaranteed you're going to be successful as long as you've got the determination, you listen. You turn up on to the events, you implement what we tell you to do, and you're going to be a success. And, and we see them as family members, not just business partners. And that's what's really made us stand out from, from where we are right now. So it sounds like um, on top of the sort of systemizing of things, right, which is like would be the obvious, like if you're uh, building a franchise model, systemizing things, it sounds like finding the right people is super key as well, right? Because uh, like... I assume that there's, uh, you know, like your heads in Australia, we are, uh, without them, you wouldn't be able to sort of have that reach, right? And like you do need to attract those people into the organisation that are just full on keepers. Do you find, like for you, was it hard to find those people or is it just a luck thing or how did you sort of attract people in which could broaden the base? We, we, we try to look for people initially, Eddie, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, success breeds success. And as long as you're out there making a noise, then you'll get people's attention. And then they're going to want to buy into your brand and or to you as a person. So with all the media coverage we were getting, which overspilled into Australia, and what Ryan Canavan had witnessed, and Sam Weir and Chris Weir had witnessed what's going on in England, they were able to... to recognize that we can do this in Australia and they took it back and initially it was difficult because just like when I launched it in England people were like you know yeah come on sell me this thing what are you trying to sell me well, you know who's this rich guy in England who's hanging around with Michael and 
and Yuri Geller and all this crazy stuff, you know. And, we, and now, now we're at a situation where people are looking up to us, saying, "Like, what's why we're on here now? What, what can you do to advise the industry? How can you help us? You, you, you come through it, you know." And it's been a lot of forgiveness that's been going on. And um, I've had martial artists call me up who've been my worst enemies. I'm like, guys, don't apologize. It's survival mode now. What do you want to know? What do you? I don't want no money from you. Just tell me what do you want to know, and I'll, I'll guide you through this situation with COVID. And if you want to join us after, join us. If you don't, that's okay too. I don't want you to go and starve and lose your martial arts school. That's fine. So we've we've been jump up and jumping on things like this and in the states and other countries to just try and offer my wisdom, as it were, to try and give people some positivity in this time, and look at the opportunities that can come out of this too. I mean, I, do I look concerned to you? Not at all, because I know the comeback from this is going to be absolutely unbelievable. I think mm. I'll be. And I'll, we got to talk about the other styles too, because I think from what I've seen, I've seen your roadmap out now. I've seen um, Ryan Canavan sent Masakana sent it to me this morning, and I see there's a big emphasis on non-contact activities, which I think will be in for maybe a year or so. The people like judo and do this, do and like either really need to rethink, not close the doors. They need to rethink how can they get around this in a non-contact environment, you know? And is it, are you really going to throw the towel in and not be able to feed your family and try and get a job with the unemployment rate so high? You're going to try and adapt your curriculum to make it happen. And you've got to lose your ego. It's all about survival. And like we said at the beginning, it's not about the movement or the style or how high you can kick. It's about what can you offer them that more than what they get at school. You know, that, that's the key. And you, so if you're teaching Aikido right now, which I think is probably the most challenging one uh, where you don't need contact, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. You agree, Eddie? I think that would be quite tough in Australia. Yeah, yeah. We, we hear it a lot from Aikido, from BJJ, Judo, as you mentioned. And um, yeah. you know, they're working with dummies. They're doing, I guess, like they're trying to win a baby in that industry, but it can be tricky, yeah. They, just, so they need to accept where we're at and they need to just... I'm sure most like, Aikido instructors in Australia have, have, have been involved in karate or taekwondo before uh, and, and teach the elements that they can teach. And um, the physical contacts are, yeah, use dummies and stuff. You can use the movement still for Aikido as form. But remember, it's the life skill, the education benefits people are looking for, not the physical how fast you can throw someone or, or on, the, on the offensive. I think Jiu Jitsu is fine. They just need to get rid of the grappling. Or use or use the, the dummies, the um, wave masters we call them. Right? You guys have got a different name from over there, like the freestanding bags and put mm. them laying on the floor. Yeah. Um, so Judith has lots of kicking and arm locks and stuff in it. We know that, but they taught them in a form process that they could get around this. So I think the hardest one is going to be hit. Sadly, it's going to be judo. Uh, mm. And I'm, I'm pretty mm. proud of having objections and, and solving problems, but. With, if I was a judo instructor right now in Australia, and I, I guess our lockdown release is going to be very similar to yours, because clearly our prime minister seemed to talk because very similar things have been happening. If mm. you're teaching judo right now, that's that's a challenge, I think, because yeah, no contact. It's definitely something I've thought about in sort of the karate in the karate area, and um, I guess you know if you look at if you look at karate and the uh the carters and how the carters lead to the bunkai and so on and so forth it's way easier to adapt right because you can sort of do that part of it for a period of time in the fitness part but i think ultimately it, it's a it's a bit of a it's a it's an up for the debate still whether like long term people will do online classes i guess right because I've seen so much variable result with it i've seen people who have got still retained sort of 60 percent of their students and uh, then I'm and at the same rates, and then I've seen people who've sort of lost everything and only been able to really retain like 10%. And I think that variability and the sort of short term uh, time that we've been in the industry like this is it's sort of rocked everybody's confidence. And it's not just, I think, the adaptation, right? I think it's also their loss of income and dealing with staff, and there's so much going on for those owners, right? But I think it's true what you say that it's just got to be adapted. And uh, one of the things we say to our um, to our community, really, or our, our members, is that every business goes through difficult times, right? So there's always something that comes up that can be devastating. 
It's just that at the moment, it's all happened to everybody at the same time. That's really the only difference. And I think you would agree uh, in your story, uh, there's no doubt in my mind, there's been many times when you've had devastating things happen to the business, right? And, uh, and even though those happened, nobody was talking about it on a mass scale because it was only happening to one person at that one time, right? And then other people go through other things, right? So I see devastating things happen to businesses as far as like losing uh, key staff members, often because these are family businesses or um, them getting devastated by some other financial thing or uh, their building closing down and or having to move and all sorts of different things, right? But it's just that they don't all happen at once. And all those people go through those things and they have to adapt and rediscover themselves and push through all those difficulties. I think it's just, it's almost because everybody's going through it at the same time. Do you feel like, like what were some of the things that you guys have gotten through as to get to where you are? Like, did you have those low times where you had a big catastrophe happen to the business? Not to the business, Sadie, but to, um, I mean, you only, you only hear about, you hear the saying, you only hear about people's successes and not their failures, right? And I've tried to start many other different businesses because I've thought, let me try this, let me try this, because you get bored of doing the same thing over and over again. But I always get brought back to the martial arts. But I've gone through tragedies. Like, you know, I lost my mum uh, in 2012. I've chewed my rock, you know. She's a lawyer. She's my inspiration. If I remember, I told you, you can do anything you want. And she had a four-year battle with breast cancer in 56. She was... She, she um, lost her life, and uh, when you see your mum going to the ground, man, that wakes you up. And uh, I look back at that situation a lot now, and then doctors at the time, they, they don't quite know how to deal with it. Plus, all around the same time, I, I, I lost, Michael Jackson died. I lost um, um, my marriage, my first marriage. That was due to me just overworking and being, being completely obsessed with my career, basically. And my mum tells me she's got six months to live, but she, she had four years to go on. And then doctors fill you with antidepressants and sleeping tablets and all this type of stuff. You can't really deal with anything. Mm. And then the only thing I really needed to do was to get back to my training. Because when, when I train, that's what I'm powerful. So situations like this is that, you know, guys, we, we, we're going to be out of this as quick as we come in it. And I'll tell you the big difference, Eddie. You almost hit it on the head there. If we go back just 15 years where we have first and mouth disease and all this other stuff, we're, we're in a digital media information age right now where a story can be heard and put out within minutes and be on the news and on Facebook and on Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, whatever you want to call it. And it's, it's an information age. So the reason why it's having such a massive devastating effect is if we just had normal television, uh, 15 years ago and coronavirus hit, I don't think we would have had a lockdown, an impact, an economic disaster or anything like that. It's the media that have got an agenda to hype this thing up so they can sell advertising space to keep ratings going. And you look at their shares, they're rising, man. They're, they're making a ton of money. They're going to spin this thing. The next thing you're going to hear about is a big house price market crash. Then it'll be the employment rate. They can keep this going for a whole year. It's every journalist's dream. And I work in media due, due to my history. And literally, it's, uh, unless you want to talk about the coronavirus or your coronavirus story, you ain't getting in any newspapers over here. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. And, I, you know, and I'm, I'm the victim as well prior to coronavirus where I'd wake up to a story where I so-called been having an affair with a supermodel a few days ago. And it's been worded so carefully, like a sword close to Matt for that, or an insider where... I work from home with my wife and I left the house for two weeks. It's impossible, but it works. They can just make up what the hell they want. Now, Donald Trump calls it fake news. It is fake mm -hmm. news, most of the mm -hmm. stuff you see. And if you watch the briefings and then you get the real truth of what's going on, we hope, and then you watch the clips that are taken onto the news, they're totally different things. They sensationalize it. So mm -hmm. that's the difference. We years ago, we had coronavirus. We wouldn't be facing lockdowns and all this crazy stuff that we're having to do right now. It's almost like an economic reset to the whole world, globally. Mm. And it's to me... Oh. And yeah, to me, we've certainly afraid. seen it in, in the last couple of days with um, what's happening in the US has come instantaneous country breakdown from a single post, right? Like from, from a single uh, video of an instance, right? And, uh, and there's... It, it is sort of... Uh, 
one of those things about news, like you say, right, that you've got to sort of keep a little bit at the forefront if you really want to promote something well. But one of the questions I was thinking about for you was what do you do to keep at the forefront of news without breaking your brand, right? Because you do have to be polarizing and have some controversy in a sense. And I know you mentioned earlier, Michael uh, was a master of this, right? And he would generate some controversy this day, top of mind, but you still don't want to break your brand essentially, right? So what advice would you have for people out there if they want to promote even locally uh, or just whatever the best advice you would have about how to do it, right? Um, to really get yourself front of mind media wise without that brand sort of breaking. Well, you don't want to be in the sports pages, like I've said before, which most martial arts schools try and get into the sports pages. You want to be in the news section because people don't get to the back of the paper. So you, you'll be putting on educational events, free workshops, um, mm. a brigade to come in and visit your school. Uh, mm. Do an online, have someone who's, um, we do it here, online um, CPR calls for parents right now who are in lockdown just in case mm. something happened to their kids, they're too scared to go to the hospital and they don't trust the hospitals right now. Or well, especially here, because we've got nearly 40,000 deaths. Maybe a little bit different out there. So so look look for extra things out there that can set you apart from the other schools. What can you what can you tap into? Teach for big brands. Don't see yourself as a little little karate school in the owner. Don't call yourself a club, call yourself a school. You're a private school. Club is an after school activity, which people just come and go you are you're a private school so you can try charge private rates and you'll have top service that you mm. you just have to, the pr is getting to know the journalist and it's a bit of give and take obviously they're going to want something from you to be able to to make the story work for them so for instance for me um when coronavirus kicked off they wanted to interview me about i wanted them to cover about how i've took my whole brand online with 24 hours and it's going to be a huge success you know everyone you know we've lost 27 percent of our members we've got the figures in today eddie and i'm really proud of all my team for that it's in the uk mm -hmm. 27 percent, and we're actually bringing people in online now signing up at a huge pace to close that gap so mm -hmm. i wanted first thing i did was i reached out to all my celebrity friends who are big influencers to say can you do me a post on about how great you feel the map for this martial arts is doing to help kids at home stay safe, boost their immune system, and so on. And I had four or five major influencers over here do it for free, post out on their Instagram, the millions of followers. So parents who are thinking about cancer and direct damage would think twice, thinking, well, if she says it's okay, and these are like people from Love Island and stuff, believe it or not, mm. they, mm. for they say it's okay, then it must be okay. You know, so, so we're not going to cancel that direct debit. So that was the first thing I did. Then I wanted to reach out to the big media outlets. And you, you know, like you're talking over here with the Sun newspaper, the Daily Mail, where they've got that brand. They may not always report things accurately. They've got that brand. So I knew in my head they're going to want something from me. And I knew exactly what they're going to want. So I wanted them to promote how well we're doing online. So our students calm down, the parents calm down, the cancellations level out, and it becomes the new norm. And we are able to enroll people online. So if I gave them a little bit, which was to talk about Michael Jackson's face mask. Do you remember that? He used to go around with a face mask all the time? When yeah. When he was outside. Yeah. Then um, I knew they would, if they had a picture of me and Michael where he wore a face mask, then I knew they would give me the online promotion. Of course, you normally have to pay for promotion. It's commercial. You normally know, mm. have to pay for the advert. So they wanted a little bit of information about why did Michael Jackson wear that face mask. In fact, they wanted more than that. They wanted a picture of me wearing one his close friend and bodyguard wearing a face mask and pictured next to him. But mm. I refused to do that because he's still my friend, you know, he's like, don't want to abuse it. So it, it was a natural fit. It worked well. I gave to them, they gave back and we had a headline story, you know, of, of our online classes. It led with, you know, the real reason Michael wore fa face mask and he, he used to worry about pandemics like this because it would affect his voice box when he had commitments to world tours and he couldn't, afford to get uh, a uh, throat infection or a flu the flu virus because he was flying he spent most of the time of his life in the airplanes than he did on the floor mm. and uh, and that was the real reason and of course he also knew uh, I, I used to be embarrassed when he used to put it on eddie and i said okay mike take it off please man it's like my friends are going to be watching this on tv <laughs> he says to me yeah it guarantees me the front pages tomorrow man 
because they're all going to be saying, well, what's happening? Is my nose going to fall off? Is this going to happen? And, mm-hmm. and all of you are doing it. You say, it's, it's our site, the fuzzle duzzle. And um, also, of course, on airplanes, he believed the air conditioning would circulate germs and stuff. And he had a duty to his fans to perform at the highest level. So that worked for us. So you, you've got to give something to the media. Well, that might be taking out some small adverts with them. Um, I don't I don't think it should be print advertising. Maybe something on, on the um, digital side now. And in return, negotiating some ad copy, um, uh, an advertorial is what it's called, a story about you, but includes a link back to your website. And it's worth paying a little money for that and building a relationship with that. I know my team have been for, um, in Australia before COVID, they made news by donating blood to their local mm. blood bank and it got on some news channels. That was a huge success. You just got to yeah. think out of the box. It really isn't that difficult, but you got to think more than the, the basic stuff is publicize every grading you've got. After the children with the certificates, make mm. sure every every grading cycle that goes in to the local papers. And then you step up from there, the awards that you can go out there and get, maybe some things with your organization. You know, mm. and then just, you know, look for testimonials. Who's got weight loss? Who's changed their lives? Who's been bullied at school and now they're not? And now they're confident. Papers want to hear about that stuff. You know, mm. that's the thing. Good news yeah, guess, um, you've got to make sure that the headline on that is uh yeah. you, you is, is actually got that controversial enough to read so it's you know martial artists bleeding or something and then it's about giving blood and yeah yeah you got to learn to accept that as either headline you'll never control and editors mm. know it's clickbait so mm. the headline i'm never happy with the headlines i mean the, the headlines the headlines i see about me and then when you click the story you get the real story they don't really relate but they get the millions of people to click the the, mm. um, the, the story, you know. So they they you know literally it's, it's always been a very controversial headline will lead you into a story which will send traffic to your Facebook pages and your website and produce you organic leads. So if I hit the news real big over here, then it normally has a I end up in Australia Daily Mail and then we have the traffic and we notice it. We have a, organic leads coming from the PR that we have. So not at the moment because. Unless you're involved with coronavirus right now, you're not going to get any media, I can assure you. Mm. So um, so we're not even trying. At the moment, it's about offering as much value you can to your students and learn how to bring new members in. That's the key. Mm. Awesome. Well, uh, look, that, I think that's some massive um, tangible things people can actually do now, right, for their clubs. So thank you so much for those um, tips. And I wanted to ask you before we sort of like wrap up at the end, um, what is the future for you now, what are you doing with uh, your group or are you working on any new projects or uh, what's your future now, Matt? We're, we're, we're gonna, our goal is to double the organization by this time next year. And we're seeing this as an opportunity because sadly, Eddie, a lot of martial artists are giving up. Like you said, they are shutting the doors. They are canceling out all their direct debits and waiting to see what's happened. Whereas my team are working as hard as they've ever had and ready to come out of this real strong and um, promote with the biggest advertisement campaign we've ever done of all time. We're going to, people are going to be sick of us and their news feed. We're going to be everywhere. And the PR, we've got all lined up, ready to go as well. So as soon as we get the all clear over here, they're going to be sick and tired of hearing about me. Um, uh, so we're all ready to go on that. Side. And on yeah, the other side too, you know, we settle things here now. So for myself personally, we, I'm going into, buying in more real estate because you can get that real cheap the deals are coming and you've got to see there's an opportunity to go in there and buy buy low and get those returns and i believe in australia more so than in england there's going to be a bit of a crash there temporarily um and also we're looking at we're setting up mf consultancy which is not for martial arts as such but it's for other businesses who are like tennis academies gymnastics academies or um, general businesses who want to who will listen to me, take our advice, and have access to my PR team, my bridging loan people to grab deals quick, our mortgage brokers, um, and it's like I'm going to be your boss, and they'll pay retainer, and we'll be very picky on clients we'll take, and that's something for me just to have a bit of fun with, really, where I'll take mm-hmm. on 20, 30 clients, and um, take them from where they want to be to to success. So I just enjoy making people successful, Eddie. I I didn't need when this pandemic was announced, the lockdown. I could have just turned my back on everybody. And lift off my property forever but they're like family to me i couldn't do that to them you know and i had to remind them at times guys guys calm down i'm here that's telling you something i'm not going anywhere and i will sell every house i have 
if I have to, to rescue all of you out of this pandemic. And this will go past. And we'll look back in a year's time and think, what the heck was that all about? And and that's happened many times in my life. And it's, uh, you know, I, I stood strong by them all as a leader. And I think you have to, too. If you show, you know, we're all humans. You all wake up each day and you think, dear, it's not normal. You have a wobble for 15 minutes. You've got to get your mindset back on. And uh, for me, training is, is the best way of doing that. I need to go out there for a very intensive walk or do some weights or something. And then I'm a different, I'm a different map for this. I'm focused then because that's what I've been used to since I'm seven years old. If you take training away from me, then I, mm -hmm. I go downhill. And um, so it all, all starts with yourself. You've got to become what other people want to become to be like you. You know, you need to represent what they want to be. They need to look up to you. They I want to be like this guy one day. How, how, mm -hmm. how's that going to happen? And um, so you have to lead them. So it's, it's more than positive thinking. It's, it's about deleting the negatives when they come into your mind. If you're going to stick in front of TV all day, you're going to be brainwashed, man. You just got to, what I say to my team, it's my job to monitor the news. I'll pick out the bits that apply to you. The rest of it, I want you all focusing on audio, download, download books, studying the greats in the world, and, um, and focusing on value to your students for recruiting. If I, if I feel there's a piece of news, I'll tell, tell you. So they don't watch the news. They they stay away from that. So like today we had an announcement. We're allowed to group, teach groups of five outdoors. So that was positive for us. And they didn't know about that. I told, told them like this morning on a Zoom conference. And they've already implemented that and they're doing it. And I think in two weeks' time, with groups is 20. And before long, we'll, we'll be in a situation where you guys are looking at. You know, So it won't be normal. But life does change and you have to adapt. And the people who adapt with things are the ones who succeed, who innovate. You don't want to be a, a, a follower. You want to be a leader. You know, in today's world, it's very easy to do that. you just got to look at what everyone else is doing. And I'm not concerned. This is a huge opportunity for the martial arts right now. If you just hang in there and offer value and be true to your word, word. And, and remember, remind yourself, too, that these are tough guys, martial arts. Are. They're, they're, they're okay getting, about getting choked out and getting kicked to the head or punched to the head or knocked out, but they're worried about a virus that may or may not ruin them. And it's been proven in all time that even the Spanish flu back in 19, 1919, like nearly 100 years ago, everyone come back from that. And today we've got technology and medicine and stuff that's never been around before. So unfortunately, life throws us lemons and we need to take lemonade out, out of that. And you need to just... Uh, we are what we are, and don't worry about what you can't control. Stop worrying about what's going on out there with the government. We can't control the government. We can control what's going on in here and what our team is. And if you can save your team through this and come out the other end, then you're going to be fine because there'll be such a massive demand for the martial arts. Parents will want you more than ever because they're pulling their hair out right now, wondering what to do with their kids, being off school and, um, and losing education higher crime rates, they're going to want you in their lives, you know. So you do, you just got to start seeing it in your mind. If you get a negative thought, el eliminate it. That's a good thing about the human brain. We can do that and then get back on track again. You can, Don't worry about what you can't control. We can't control what's going on. We can't change the pandemic. we just got to listen to the, the scientists and work within the law and um, be true to what we are. If, you, if you're willing to get kicked in the head and choked out, this is no big deal to you guys. It really isn't. Going online is not that painful. Actually, some of my team are quite enjoying it. They're quite enjoying it. No, that's, it's but, so true. And I, I'm sure she was listening to you go there, and I was just thinking about people listening in who are going through a rough time and, uh, and that it's not the end, right? It's not the end for them. It's just really a way of resetting in a new beginning. And so, um, Matt, how, how do people find you for both the personal uh, coaching that you're looking at doing as well as uh, your business coaching as well as uh, Matt Fittis, uh as far as the, the chain as well? How do they find you there? Uh, very simple. They just email my initials, mf at mattfidesz.com, M-A-T-T-F-I-D-E-S.com, or they go to my website, mattfidesz.com, and uh, send me an email. It'll get passed to me at some stage. Um, or if you're in Australia, around the world, then we'll, we'll get back to you guys. So uh, anything we can do to help, we're here to serve and, and help you through this situation. But everyone's just got to calm down. And this organization is brilliant, what you guys are doing for everyone, by the way. And you, you, you're reaching out, no matter what the politics has been in the past, bringing great minds together 
and it's down to people like you, Eddie, to, that to, uh, are going to save marriages, incomes, families from suffering. When if you haven't gone online, then it's not too late. Your students will come back and, and come online. You need to do more than come online. You need to go live with them with class, class, classes. And the only difference is if you're operating by Zoom, is that you're not physically there, but you can still offer the same situation, you know, the same service. And if you don't want to do gradings online, it's tough. You have to. You know, the only thing I personally feel I don't want to do is give a black belt online. I don't want anyone to be labeled with a coronavirus black belt. Uh, but if it comes to that one day, we might have to do that. But I don't believe we will. And um, what's exciting is what I see on the screen here. You've got relaunch. Well, we're looking forward to that. To us, it's the relaunch. It's the relaunch of MF Martial Arts. And we will come back bigger like you never see before. It'll just be an explosion. We've, we've got our marketing fund ready, our advocates ready. It's all in place. And we just got to wait for the government to say go. And then, bam, we're off like we were back in 97 more than ever. So um, we're excited by it. We really are. All my team are. There's no negativity in the MF group whatsoever. So, and uh, yeah. Yeah, we're, here, we're here to help any of you guys. So just contact us and uh, we'll do our best to guide you the best way we possibly can. That's awesome. And, th and thank you so much for being a part of this. I guess this is our first interview in a series we're going to keep doing these every week and uh and what a, an amazing amazing amount of awesome info uh you've provided to people so thank you so much for your time matt uh we'd like to finish it off with one little quick uh q a we like to fire these questions off uh so we get real-time responses uh if you're okay. humorous, what is uh, a hobby you've got side outside of martial arts at the moment a hobby that you uh do Absolutely, it's kind of boring, but I like, I like a weight. Let me try and think of a hobby outside of martial arts. That I do. I, I, I still like learning. To me, learning is interesting. So I study all the um, business gurus and stuff like that. So I've gone from reading books to audio books. So I probably go through two or three of them a week. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of like to study outside of our industry. And I think that's where the answers come, Eddie, because. Uh, We've got what we have, but now we need to look for more. What are other industries doing right now? What can we learn from other people? So um, mm. self-help, coaching, education, other great leaders, looking back from 100 years ago of people who've been through World War II, five years of lockdown with bombs coming down, with rationed food, and we're worried mm. about being told to stay at home. It's kind of ridiculous when you think about it. So um, self-help is uh, the kind of thing. But my, my hobby is I, I love weight training. Um, that is my my thing, you know. Uh, martial arts, I don't remember a time I've never done it, but weight training is something that for, after you finish a weight training workout, I'm ready for my day, you know, I'm ready to do any challenge. And I firmly believe if you if you grow your body or strengthen your body, it's going to strengthen your mind. They're very connected. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's really a long answer to your wanted short question. No, but, uh, and uh, well, on the books thing, anything you're reading at the moment that is uh, just an e epic book that you'd recommend? I think people got to be aware. It's just it's a warning to put out there. There's a lot of uh, so-called coaches out there now appearing, trying to take advantage of this situation in COVID. That you got to before you go and buy into any course or buy an audio book or program, dig into these people's backgrounds and look at where they've come from and so on. You know, and and make sure they're for real because I see many people pop out there. Um, a kind of, few people I'm kind of impressed with with the material. Really, I, I think people should jump on and look at Grant Cardone stuff. I mean. He's he's in a he's in a way where he's brought Robert Kiyosaki's information to the new era, and Tony Robbins' information. I mean, I like fifty percent of his material. I think he's uh he's onto something there. He sold out a big venue in Vegas recently, and um, he's got that charisma and that strength about him. But you kind of need to look at his attitude towards COVID nineteen. He don't care less. He mm -hmm. knows he's going to go and buy up real estate and sell out courses. He's not worried. So I think at a time like his. Grant Cardone, I know he visited Australia not so long ago. Yeah, 10X rule, he, right? 10X, yeah. I think he, he's, he's onto something there. And um, like the, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series, that guy's a smart guy, Robert Kurosaki. He, he's a very smart guy when it comes to investing. So the martial arts business we figured out, you've got to learn now where you can put your money when we're back rolling again into an investment which will pay you passive income so you don't have to worry about these times ever again so this happened again you can be calm because you're invested in property or, um, or, or something else i think in australia gold is very 
very much the, um, the the recommended investment right now, which I've never ventured into. I've always been property. So look at what can you do to stop this happening again? Not a p- pandemic, but to provide for your family so you don't have to panic or worry. And that's study investment. So study Grant Cardone, what he's doing all about real estate. And also Robert Kurosaki is pretty much all about real estate and, and business too. So go to yeah. I could definitely hear some Robert Kiyosaki in your investment advice with the, yeah. uh, the quadrant. Um, what's one oh, yeah, thing you Oh, you jump in? Yeah. yeah, I'll tell you one thing about Grant Cardone is um, the only one thing I disagree with him on is he's always given advance that you shouldn't ever own your own home, which I used to teach this too, because the money that's tied up in your own home, you can use to develop passive income and then rent. But at times like this, Eddie, uh, if you do own your own home and you have a passive income coming in, it's okay. So I think I think the rules have changed a little bit. I think what you need to do is maybe rent, that's fine, build up a passive income that you can survive on, then buy your own home. Then you've got a total bulletproof security around you. Mm. So you know, like we talked about earlier on, the mindset you used to be taught is get a job, you know, um, get a job and pay your taxes, get your pension paid, own your own home. Retire at 65, and then, yeah, that's it. I mean, he's, he's just going to be excited about that. Take one holiday a year. So what you need to be looking at doing, really, is going into rented, use your money, invest into a business or property. I, I say business first to get the income coming in because it's where you get tax less. Then a property to get the, the um, income in because even in times like this, I've got a lot of property. And if my tenants can't pay the rent, the government will. You know, that's not being affected. The rental income is coming in as strong, strong as ever. You can actually insure your staff too against rent. You can have rental guaranteeing policies in place. So I think the, the key is martial artists need to look out the box here. Um, so use your business and develop. Don't think that it's going to keep going on forever and ever and ever and ever. Everything comes to, to an end in time unless you adapt and innovate. But the ones who've invested in something else have got passive income coming in where it's another business or, or property, which I'm a real fan of, because you shouldn't buy a, a property thinking you want to make money on the, the capital, whether it goes up and down. I couldn't care less. All you need to worry about is the difference between the buy-to-let mortgage and the rent, the passive income, and get mm-hmm. enough of them for the future income, then buy your own home. Once you've done all that, you use your business then to buy off, to pay off your buy-to-let mortgages, and then before you know it, you're financially completely independent. And when things come around like this, you don't have to worry. And it's not that hard to do. It's like a five or six year plan. And it's done. You know, it's very simple mm. to do. Mm. Mm. And do you, do you uh, just as a side sheet before we get to the last question, do you um, advise people to purchase the properties that their uh, premises are on, right, as far as the club? Or is that is it more like a... Um, you know, I know McDonald's, people think of McDonald's as the they're selling burgers, but the real business is the ownership of the land, right? How do you see that uh, with dojos? I'm not, I know what you mean by McDonald's. So McDonald's is the second biggest real estate, real estate holders other than the Catholic Church in the whole world. And they're in the real estate business. The franchise bit is just a little bit that's on top there. So they own all the buildings. Um, with me, I'm a, I'm a, I, I don't believe in full-time martial arts schools. I, I I hate full-time martial arts schools because I've had one and I've seen many friends have them and, and go out of business where times like this, if you're renting school halls, when it comes to you can't have the facility, well, you're not paying rent anymore. And also, you're, if you're in a school hall, you're seen as education. If you're in a full-time martial arts school, you're seen as a gym, a sports field. It's very, very sports time category. It's very different. So in the lockdown release, you'll, you'll see full-time academies will be treated differently to people that have been treated who are renting school or council or um, facilities, very much so. So I don't believe in owning your own business facility or renting a full-time premises. You need to be in bed with the head teachers, not, not physically in bed with them, but mentally in bed with them, working with them, and have them develop work with you to develop students into your school. If you're hiring their premises, they're going to have an incentive to pump students into your school. If you've got to build it, clearly your business, and they won't do that. That's my experience for 24 years. So in America, it's different. It's a different model. You can't hire schools like you can in the UK or Australia. So mm-hmm. um, maybe, have, maybe have one place, but very small, if you're going to build a network as a HQ, and you do your staff training there and so on, 
but it, it really is not needed to have full-time schools and i feel they'll be the first people to get back there their buildings and get into business and they'll be the first people to go out of business because they're going into major overheads with business rates tax cleaning all this crazy stuff whereas if you hire a school hall you're fine so like in england now for the last 11 12 weeks they've not had any expenses so they're operating online with no expenses whereas if you've got a full-time facility you're going to be expected to still pay your rent your taxes that you have to pay to go with it electricity bills and everything else water and so on and when you go back you you're going to lose some of your student base and you've got a headache around you. So I've, I've always found the people who started off in full-time schools in 97 are no longer around. They're no longer around in England. That might be different in Australia, but I, I'm not a believer. I don't teach that system at all. Yeah, very, interesting. all very interesting. Very interesting. Because so I, I schools are large um, fixed-based schools, I guess, and then they're, they're trying to grow beyond that. And uh, that could maybe that could be part of the cap to it is the overriding expenses to running – those fixed premises schools. Yeah. Um, one last question for you there, Matt, uh, before you go, is um, what is the one thing you can't live without? Uh, my family. family, definitely. Yeah, I've got six children. I don't know how that, how that happened. And <laughs> um, yeah, my family, my wife, and uh, if you ain't got that, you ain't got that. Your family and your health. Wealth comes third on the list. Family, health, and then wealth is the, the last thing on the list. Because mm -hmm. you, you need a roof over your head and, and, and the food to feed them. That's that's it. And as long as you got that, our grandparents, great grandparents, didn't have that, you know. And uh, whatever happens, you're always going to find a way back. You're always going to find a way to make money. I mean, you're always going to find a way to to do it. And there'll always be a need for education and martial arts as long as you operate in the right sector. That's the key there. So I can't, I, I you know, I can't live without my um, my family and of course my training. If I didn't train, that has a bit of a negative effect on me. And just to revisit the last question, just to give you a little bit of a takeaway about how I built mine. Think about how McDonald's has structured it, okay? And look what I've done. So I don't have big places with four or 500 people in. I have hundreds of places with 40 people in and maybe six or seven locations in one town. That's what McDonald's have done, isn't it? So that's what I've copied. I copied their model. So when people say I'm McDojo, to me, that's the biggest compliment in the world. They're comparing me to the biggest franchise organization in the world, so screw them. So it doesn't bother me at all. And um, lots of little locations, people don't want to travel. Rather than one big location, then you're going to be secure. It's easy mm. to maintain groups of 30 around a town and do that 10 times than it is to have 300 members and maintain that in one location. That's difficult. And then and longevity for 10, 15 years, that's hard to do. So if you want to be a success, you need to follow the McDonald's system. Not about burgers, about how they've made sure they spaced out three or four mile, mile radius. I know Australia, they've got them everywhere. You know, they don't just have one line, do they? Yeah, yeah. So. Very interesting. It's a, I think that it is a, a massive insight for people to really hear that. Uh, because they don't know, you know, people don't know how the bigger, um, how you've done it, right, with this, with sizing and um, it's some of those little details that can make all the difference. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time out. I know you're a busy, busy guy and uh, flying all around the place and doing everything you do for everybody in your community. But uh, thanks again for turning up and uh, being with us. I know it's a late night for you now and you've gone way over time. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, been an amazing interview. We really commend you for everything you're doing for the community. You're welcome, sir. Keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. And we will catch you next time. Bye for now. Brilliant. Thank you, sir.